Hello and welcome to the North Carolina Museum of History. My name is Sally Bloom and I'm glad you can join us for our live streaming event today on American Indians in North Carolina. Remember, during the class, if you have a question or a comment, you can type it in on the YouTube page. Or if you're watching through Beyond the Exhibit's Facebook page, um, you can type in comments and questions there. We'll try to get to them during the course of the class, and if not, I'll make an effort to answer all of your questions after the class is over. Well, let's get started. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn to a classmate and tell them the very first thing you think about when you say American Indians. Are you ready? Okay, in just a moment, turn to your classmate and tell them the very first thing you see in your mind's eye when I say American Indian, Native American. What do you see? Did some of you say feathers, bows and arrows, moccasins? Yeah, I think about those things too. And those are really cool, interesting things about people who lived in the land of North Carolina a long, long time ago. In fact, right now we're in the story of North Carolina, our 20,000 square foot exhibit that covers 14,000 years of history, and it has lots of artifacts from these people who lived a long time ago. I wanna share with you one of my favorite artifacts from these people who lived here a long time ago. Come over here with me and take a look at this. Take a look at this stone here. It's obviously had some work done on it, and the work on that stone, the carving out of that, is three to 5,000 years old. But what is it? What is that stone? Well, it's actually one of these. That's right, it's a nutcracker. People that lived in the land of North Carolina three to 5,000 years ago pitted out parts of the stone to crack nuts, and then they could stack up the meat of the nuts in other places. In fact, people have been living in this land for 12 to 14,000 years. Now, the people that lived here that long ago were really good at using stones to make tools and weapons. They knew how to pick a stone, chip off parts of it to create um, a sharp cutting tool or a pounding tool or to create a spear point. In fact, they had a weapon called an atlatl, and this is part of an atlatl. You would attach a spear to it with a spear point, and it would allow you to hurl a spear a really long distance, which was really useful if you were hunting mastodons. Yeah, we had these critters here in the land of North Carolina a long time ago, uh, along with ground sloths and giant bison. Now, the people that lived here in the land 12, 14,000 years ago were nomadic, which meant they moved around a lot to find the resources they need, hunting, gathering plants and berries. They didn't have three things that we often think about uh, when we think about North Carolina American Indians, and those things were bows and arrows, farming, and pottery. In fact, it was the transition to using those kinds of things and having those kinds of activities that marks a change in American Indian culture, a change that we call woodland culture. About 3,000 years ago, American Indians in North Carolina started settling down in villages. They started growing small gardens. Um, over time, their villages grew larger, their communities grew larger, and there were hundreds of different tribes, each with their own culture and their own history and they started growing corn and beans and squash. And to hold those crops and to cook those crops, they started making pottery. This pot here is over 2,000 years old. That's just amazing to me that we still have it and it survives. It could be placed in the ashes of a fire or it could be placed directly on the fire to cook those crops. Wow. Now, I want you to take a look at this. Do you think this is just like a fallen down, rotted old tree? You know what this is? This is actually a canoe. It's from Lake Phelps, which is in present day Washington County in northeastern uh, North Carolina. Indians lived all around Lake Phelps and uh, canoes were perfect for moving goods and people around uh, fishing and all kinds of activities. I want to bring in some of my friends here because I want to show you something about these canoes. Several dozen of these canoes were found in Lake Phelps in 1986, and the largest canoe was 40 feet long and could hold 20. Count them. Everybody give away. These are my friends. 20 people. Imagine a canoe with 20 people in it. Pretty amazing, huh? There they all are. All right. Do you think you could row a canoe with 20 people? I don't know that I could, but I think they could do it. We don't even have everybody yet. Fit in, everybody. Give away about to all the students in North Carolina who are watching you today. All right, 20 people in a canoe, pretty amazing. A 40-foot canoe in Lake Phelps in North Carolina. Thanks, everybody. But how did they make those canoes, and what were they made of? Well, they were made out of cypress trees often, which is really light. This is cypress wood right here. The only other things they had to make these canoes would be fire, stone tools, and shells. 
so they could start a fire at the base of a tree and that would help fell the tree. Then they could use stone tools and shells to um, dig out the top of the tree that they could also set fire to. So pretty amazing ingenuity building those canoes. Well, let's get back to those villages we were talking about. I'm going to share with you a drawing of an early American Indian village from North Carolina. This is a reproduction and a blow up of a drawing that John White made, a watercolor actually, that he painted in July of 1585. Now, John White was sent here by Sir Walter Raleigh on one of his expeditions to explore the land that would become North Carolina. And Sir Walter Raleigh tried to have settlements here, and we know a little bit about that history. But let's focus on this amazing drawing. Now, let's remember, John White uh, painted dozens of watercolors. They were copied and distributed all around the world. They're some of the most popular images of what uh, these people and this land. Um, of course, it is from his perspective. It would be interesting if we had any surviving artwork from American Indians from that time of John White to see what their perspective of his was, right? He was a European coming here. He didn't know much about these people or this land. But let's take a look at this drawing. July 1585, we see uh, an Indian community. They're dancing and singing. They've got gourd rattles. They've got tree branches. Look at these poles they're dancing around. They have faces carved in them. Amazing. We're so fortunate that these watercolors uh, still exist today and that we can use them to understand more about the people that lived here. Wherever American Indians lived in the land of North Carolina, they found everything they needed in the natural world to create their homes. In fact, this is a reproduction of a dwelling that Piedmont tribes would have used in North Carolina. They generally built circular dome structures um, that were 18 to 25 feet in diameter. They used saplings uh, lashed with uh, fibrous cords and then they draped them with bark. It's really big, it's really homey, you could have several families in here or quite an activity. I think it's pretty amazing. I'm so glad we have this here at the museum. Now Indians at this time were trading, not just with their Indians in North Carolina, but long distances. They traveled up and down what would become the eastern and midwestern United States. And that reminds me, I want to show you some European trade goods that ended up in the Piedmont region of North Carolina in the 1600s. Come meet the Saratown woman. This figure is of a woman from the Sara tribe. She lived along, uh, the Sara tribe was located along the Dan River in the Piedmont and Virginia uh, areas of uh, the southeast. And she is wearing um, a dress and some jewelry that I want to talk about. You should know that she is a forensic reconstruction of archaeological remains, which means she's a very accurate representation of an actual woman who lived in the 1660s in North Carolina and died when she was about 20 years old. Now, unlike what her grandmother would have been wearing, the jewelry on her dress um, is not made from shell beads or bone, but she has glass European beads and brass bells. Those must have come a very long distance and were traded to Indians who would have traded with her. Europeans were not in this part of North Carolina at this time. The only settlers in the land of North Carolina in the 1660s were up in northeastern North Carolina. So these must have been trade goods that reached her some other way. Take a look at that corn as well, right? It's not like the corn we see today. It's a lot smaller, but this is what corn was like at the time. We wanted to make her as accurate as we could. She must have been a person of some great importance to be dressed so finely. So what happened to American Indians in the land of North Carolina? Well, we believe that in about, uh, in the 1500s, there were probably 100,000, over 100,000 American Indians in this land. By 1800, there were only 20,000 American Indians left. What happened to them? Well, American Indians did not have immunity to diseases that Europeans brought with them, like measles, influenza, um, they, they couldn't resist that or fight it off. And so thousands of American Indians died from that. Also, Indians were pushed off their land by European explorers. Um, sometimes they would sign treaties that required them to move. Um, other times there was warfare between them and Europeans or other Indian tribes that meant they lost their land um, and their lives. Still, they maintained community, they maintained as much of their culture as they could, and they survived. Wow, that's been a lot of history in a very short period of time because I want to focus on American Indians today. I do want to say though that um, in the era of segregation in the 1900s, we talk about frequently about racism that blacks in North Carolina and across this country experience. Well, American Indians experienced that too. 
um, where our communities were segregated, American Indians were more segregated. Where there was not educational opportunities for blacks, there certainly wasn't for American Indians either. The education they did have was often from volunteer um, Indian homes and, I mean, schools that they built themselves and staffed themselves. Um, in some counties, there was tri-racial segregation. By that, I mean um, three entrances, say, to a movie theater. This was in Robinson County, North Carolina. Still, they persevered and survived. And today, of course, they have educational employment opportunities like everyone else in our state. Now, I want to introduce you to someone who can talk about American Indies in North Carolina today. This is my good friend, Taryn Smith. Hello everyone, my name is Taryn and I'm a member of the Saponi tribe, one of the eight state recognized tribes in North Carolina. Great, all right, we've got some questions for you. You ready? In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to either type in the comment field or tell a neighbor your best guess on how many American Indians live in North Carolina today. All right, I'll give you a moment, do your best guesstimate. What do you think? Did you guess 50, a million? A thousand? Well, according to the last census in 2010, when we counted all the people in the state, there were 122,110 American Indians in North Carolina. Probably more people than you were thinking. As a fact, uh, this is more people, uh, more American Indians than in any state east of the Mississippi River. Pretty large uh, number of people. All right, our next question, and Taryn might have given you a hint. Let's see if you were paying attention. We want to know how many tribes you think are in North Carolina today. Turn to your neighbor, give them your best guess on how many tribes are in our state. Are you guessing dozens? A hundred? Four? Well, the actual number of tribes recognized by the state of North Carolina is eight. All right. Now, to see where the names of those tribes are, where their cultural centers are located, and a little bit more about them, Taryn's going to share some information. All right, and as I say the names of the tribes, you might want to try repeating after me so you can practice saying the names and becoming familiar with them. And we are going to go in alphabetical order. Um, so the first tribe is the Coharie tribe, and they're from Sampson and Harnett County in North Carolina. Our next tribe is the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and they're from the mountains in Graham, Jackson, and Swain counties. The next tribe we have is the Halawasa Pony and they are in Halifax and Warren counties. And that's where they get the name Halawa from, Halifax and Warren. Our next tribe is the... Meharan? Lumbee tribe. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. the, <laughs> the Lumbee tribe from uh, Robison, Robison, um, Hope, and Scotland. They're in Cumberland County as well. Our next tribe is Meharan, and they're up in the northeast, and they're from um, Hertford County. Then we have the Okanichi tribe. The Okanichi is in Orange and Alamance counties. Next we have the Saponi tribe, which is my tribe, and we're up in Person County, North Carolina. I'm in the wrong place. There's my hair on. There's the Saponi. You gotta correct me when I go. <laughs> Sorry. And our last tribe is the Waccamaw Suwan tribe, and they're down um, towards the coast on Lake Waccamaw. So those are eight tribes. So you can see these um, tribes are located pretty much all across North Carolina. But it's really important that you understand that while their cultural centers might be located here and a lot of uh, Indians belong to those tribes might live there, American Indians are not required to live in those places or any place. They're free to come and go and live wherever they like. All right, next question for you, ready? Let's see how you do on this one. Our next question for you is about work. I want you to turn to your neighbor or type in the comments field, tell me, what kind of jobs do you think American Indians are doing in North Carolina today? What kind of work do you think they're doing? Let's see what you think about that. Did some of you guess hunting or fishing or making pottery? Yeah, it's possible that somebody is so successful at pottery that being an artist and making a living, we certainly have commercial fishermen in our state. I don't know that many people that make a living that earn a paycheck by hunting. I'm wondering if you're thinking about those activities that historic Indians did a long, long time ago. Um, and just like most of us don't do the same jobs our ancestors did for a paycheck to buy groceries and pay the rent, and go to the movies, things like that, American Indians don't either. Taryn here can share some of the jobs that American Indians are doing today. So we have uh, American Indians in this state who have law degrees and social work degrees and act as directors of centers. We even have American Indian astronauts. 
We have American Indian singers and songwriters. This is Charlie Lowry, who was on American Idol, and she's also in a, in a band in North Carolina. We have directors, filmmakers. We also have senators, so people in government. We also have authors and actors. They write all, all sorts of books. All right, terrific. You know, we're all part of a culture, um, sometimes multiple cultures, and so are American Indians, right? And while they're going to school and going to work and they've got basketball practice this afternoon and they want to go to dance class and want to hang out with their friends, many American Indians in our communities are taking the time to continue some of those traditional traditions and cultural celebrations that their ancestors did a long time ago, maybe like a lot of us do in our own cultures. And for a modern take, oh, well, and, and you should know, right, that we don't go around, anybody I know, very few people I know go around dressed like their ancestors did hundreds of years ago. And American Indians don't either. So to talk about a kind of modern take on traditional clothing, um, Tara's going to share with you some information about regalia. All right, so regalia is something that American Indian uh, people might wear. Not every day we wear normal clothes, just like you do on, on an everyday basis, but for some special occasions like powwows or ceremonies, we might wear regalia. And we don't call it a costume, because a costume is something that you wear when you're pretending to be something that you're not. So we gotta make sure we don't call regalia a costume. Uh, and just like certain fashions and the clothes you wear have progressed and evolved and there's certain trends, so has regalia. So our regalia changes over time and evolves over time just like we did as people and all of us do as people. Alrighty, so here we have some images of some American Indians from North Carolina in their everyday clothes and in their regalia. You can see quite a change. Does it take a long time to put on regalia? It can. It can, yeah. Do people make it themselves? A lot of times people take a lot of pride in making regalia themselves and enjoy making it and it's something extremely special to each person um, and they personalize it. So do, are they required, are American Indians required to use only materials from a long time ago to make their regalia? No, we do evolve. So just like the fashions and, and trends that you all wear evolve, so do our regalia. And so um, a lot of times now there's modern elements on regalia. Sometimes people put CDs on there to make it flashy, neon colors and glittery fabric. So it evolves just like we do. Very cool, very cool. Well, that reminds me, talking about um, modern take on traditional things, I want to show you some other artifacts from the story of North Carolina. Now, these artifacts are not thousands of years old. They're not even hundreds of years old. They're just a few years old, and they're beautiful works of art by American Indians in our state. I am going to read the labels for these because I want to make sure I get them right. Right here, we have a white oat basket. Now, you can see it's a traditional medium, but it has a modern take on it. It's only a few years old. It was made by Emma Squirrel Taylor, and she made her first basket when she was, at, when she was seven years old. By watching her mother, she learned how to do it. And she later studied with other Indians. Over here, we have a different basket, a river cane basket. All right, and it's made by Lottie Queen Stamper, who taught other girls how to weave and help revitalize this craft that came from so long ago. This beautiful vase is made by a Louise Big Meat Manny, and she learned traditional pottery skills from her mother, who had learned it from her mother. But still, she could take her own take and use uh, modern skills if she wanted, modern uh, ways of making pottery. And finally, we have this delightful bear. I have to tell you, he's one of my favorite artifacts in the exhibit. Um, and this was carved by Amanda Crow. And she started carving when she was four years old. And she was able to sell some of her crafts starting at age eight. She's known for her bears, and I can see why. That's pretty beautiful, huh? Wow. So remember how I asked you at the beginning, what do you think about when I say American Indians? Well, I hope you're starting to think about some different things and different activities than those original things you were thinking. Sometimes, however, when we think about American Indians, um, sometimes we think things that are just flat out wrong and can even be hurtful to American Indians. Sometimes we think that we know what everyone thinks and it's just too simple to be true. Those things are stereotypes. And I want Taryn here to share some information with you about stereotypes of American Indians. So these are some images that you might see on TV, in movies, in advertisements, on products in the store. And these are misrepresentations of American Indian people. So you might see costumes for Halloween, and as we've learned, it's not called a costume. Um, and these are something that are very special to Native people. And then you might see images such as this with sports teams and things like that. Um, and we saw 
pictures of American Indian people today, and as you can tell, this doesn't actually look like us. I don't look like this picture, neither do a lot of American Indians in the state. And here are some other more stereotypical images. And so as you see these images, because you will see them in movies and on TV and in advertisements, just keep in mind that this is not actually how American Indian people look. Right. Yeah, so, and it's always an opportunity for you if a friend or somebody says something that sounds like a stereotype about American Indians, it's your opportunity to say, hey, I've actually seen some American Indians. They live in North Carolina right now, and I know something different. All right, that's your opportunity to share what you're learning. Well, we've covered a lot in a short period of time because we want to leave time for some questions from you today. So Chelsea, do you have any questions for us? All right, we got some questions coming from you guys. I'm excited to see what you're gonna say. Stump the educators, here we go. How do you make regalia? How is a regalia made? So there's lots of different ways it can be made, and there's lots of different kinds of regalia. So it depends on what kind. Usually regalia goes with the kind of dance that the, the person does in a powwow. So if, um, you can have like a jingle dress that a lot of women wear. That's a type of dance, and then your regalia looks different. Um, a lot of times people make regalia just with their sewing machines and um, sew together like the dress or the, the shirt or whatever it may be. Uh, beadwork is also a really big element of regalia also and so a beadwork takes a lot of time to make. You make it with needle and thread and, and um, glass or seed beads as well. So there's tons of different ways to make regalia. I think this is regalia for the fancy shawl dance. It's, is that, that is um, traditional. Oh, that's traditional. traditional. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you for correcting me. So that's yeah. women's traditional. This is a jingle cone dress, yep. right? Yep. And when you see jingle cone dancers dancing, oh, it's amazing to hear them. It's all very rhythmic. And what about this gentleman? Is he in? Grass. He's a grass dancer. Do you have a question about the the medallion the gentleman's wearing? Yes, so that's beadwork. As I just mentioned, um, a lot of men and women wear medallions, and uh, some people wear it with regalia, some people wear it with just their normal street clothes as well, um, but that is also a, a form of beadwork, and people personalize their medallions um, and put any kind of design they would like on it. Um, traditionally, women are supposed to braid their hair um, when they uh, wear regalia uh, and when they're in a powwow or, or something like that. Um, but other than that, we just wear our hair however we want to wear it. Yeah, so here's a young woman without her hair fixed for a powwow. And then I do have a picture of her. There she is with her hair braided and pulled back. And if you want, Chelsea, you can tell us who's asking these questions and where they're from because we're curious too. Okay. We can both talk about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, just like we talked about how people evolve, we live in houses and apartments and townhouses just like you all do. Um, so, maybe in the past, American Indians lived in other types of houses and other types of dwellings, but now we live in, in houses just like you all with our TVs and electricity and, and everything like that. That was a really good question from Middle Creek Middle School. Um, because, I, again, I think it's really important to recognize that most of us don't live in homes like our ancestors did. Um, your ancestors might have been in a log cabin or in a dugout, all different kinds of homes. We don't live in those anymore, nor do American Indians. They're around you in your community right now, today. Great question. Another one? Uh, what is a powwow? Good question. A powwow. What is a powwow? Who's that from? That is from Weatherstone. Weatherstone. Elementary. Um, most tribes in the state have powwows. It's a time, it's, they last a couple days, usually over the weekend. Um, it's a time where dancers and singers and drummers come together um, and uh, we have traditional dances. It's a time to reunite with families. Um, various tribes come together, so there will be many people from different tribes at one powwow. Um, and it's just a time that we celebrate and, and practice our culture. And powwows started about 65 years ago to help. Uh, celebrate the community and the traditions of North Carolina um, American Indian tribes and other tribes across the country. And powwows are open to everybody. You're invited. You can go to the North Carolina American Indian Commission's website and from there get links to all the tribes websites in our state and find out about their powwows and you can go and attend one. Really a fun time. Is 
and Hope Mill's question about what's the correct terminology, American Indian or Native American? Do you want to go for that, Taryn? Or? Sure. Um, I, I get this question a lot when we do presentations, and I, for me, there's really no preference in a lot of American Indians, or I say American Indian, but you know, people use that term interchangeably and say Native, Native American. Um, none of those terms are really offensive to me, but I can't speak for everyone, so it, that might vary. I think in North Carolina, our understanding is to say American Indians here in our state. Other places might have different understandings. Great question. I'm waiting for another one from the sidelines. Do you make shoes out of beadwork for your real And that is from Repeat the question. So the question was, do you make shoes out of beadwork for your regalia? Um, and a lot of people do put beadwork on, on moccasins or on shoes. Uh, that's a great question. Um, usually they're made out of like a, a leather type material, and then people do beadwork on top of it. So beadwork can be incorporated with those. But it wouldn't be all beadwork. That would be right. pretty uncomfortable, and I think it would fall apart. So probably not so good to wear. Another question. The question was, does each tribe have their own language that they speak to each other? Um, and so in the state of North Carolina, there's three different language groups. And so a couple of tribes may, might fall into the same language group. Um, to, some of these tribes still speak their language. A lot of them have been lost due to history and things like that. Um, so there are language groups, and that means the, those tribes have similar customs or traditions. Um, do you right. Think? Yeah. right, so historically, a long time ago, when I was talking about well, there were three ma major language groups in North Carolina, um, there was Iroquois, Algonquian, Siouan, mm -hmm. and these similar language groups is what allowed American Indians to trade over very long distances. They could go all the way up to New England and what became Midwestern United States and still find other tribes in their same language group and they could communicate with each other. Now over time, because of the loss of um, so many people and the changes in cultures over time, some of these languages were lost. The Cherokees still speak their language, um, are still trying to teach it out in Western North Carolina. Um, and other Indian groups are trying to resurrect some of their languages and, and continue that heritage. Um, but in North Carolina, American Indians speak English, right? And they may study languages in school, they may speak Spanish or French or German, just like a lot of us study languages. But yeah, they speak English. Do American Indians celebrate holidays that are different from traditional holidays? Um, and that's from Braxton and Weatherstone uh, Elementary School. Weatherstone Elementary, do Indians celebrate different holidays than other people's? All people celebrate different holidays, right. don't they? <laughs> yeah, uh, we may, we celebrate the holidays that uh, most people um, celebrate and in the Christian faith uh, celebrate also. Um, so it's, it's similar in that respect, but then uh, specific tribes might have certain days out of the year that are special to them. So maybe it's the weekend that they host their powwow or something like that. But other than that, we celebrate the same holidays. Is it's, there only one reservation for all of the tribes or does each tribe have their own reservation? In North Carolina, the only tribe that has their own land is the Eastern Band of the Cherokee. The Koala Boundary Reservation out in Western North Carolina is their own specific land. Other tribes are buying land, but that's not a treaty land not given to them or given back to them uh, by the government. Um, but American Indians live wherever they want to live and they go wherever they want to go. Mm -hmm. And they might have community centers that they own jointly. We have um, a lot of the tribes in the state besides Cherokee have our own uh, tribal territory or land that we consider um, that's where we have always been from. But it's not necessarily a reservation. Siler City Elementary wants to know how you make jewelry. I don't know, but if you come this week on Friday or Saturday, you'll see American Indians making jewelry. Taryn can speak to that. Yeah, so there's lots, lots of different kinds of jewelry, just like you all have different kinds of jewelry as well. And so we have uh, turquoise, we have beadwork, so tons of different things. Um, I can't speak to all of them because I don't really know how to make all of them. I, I do beadwork, but that's about it. But yes, um, there will be a lot of demonstrations here on Saturday about the different kinds of uh, jewelry, and it, it is an art form that's important to Native people and Native culture, so there are many different types. Great. Do all tribes have their own flags or seals? Yeah, you want to talk a little bit about the yeah. insignia? So the question was, um, do all tribes have their own flags or seals? And yes, they do. And you can see a lot of them on this map here. I can bring them up. Yeah, each seal and insignia um, has 
significance to the tribe. So there might be elements on there that are important to their culture. There might be elements um, that discuss or signify um, maybe a date uh, that's important to them, certain that's images. Talk about, talk about your tribe. Yeah, so. Funny. Yeah. Sorry. So, no, it's okay. Um, so this is my tribe's insignia, and so we have um, many different elements on this. Um, the stars at the top represent our, our faith or our Christianity. Um, the arrowheads under it represent um, a tattoo that our uh, tribes people used to have on them to signify that they were a, um, a friendly trading tribe, but this was uh, hundreds of years ago. Um, we also have crops on here because as Sally mentioned, crops were very important to Native people, and that's how we made our living. Um, and we also have the feathers below, seven of them as well, and that represents our seven families or clans. So you'll find this a lot with, with any insignia, um, things that are important to each tribe. I know a little bit about this one, but you go ahead. This is the Wakamasuan, the people of the falling star. Mm -hmm. um, and they have a creation story uh, that they were created when a, a meteor um, struck the earth and created Lake Wakama. And so this is a part of that creation story. And so they've put that on their flag or their insignia because that's important to them. Any others you want to talk about? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So again, you can go to um, each of the tribes in North Carolina has a website with information about their history and their culture and their activities, and you can check those insignia out. That was a great question. Uh, this is also from Siler City. Do tribes ever change their customs? That's a great question. So the question was, do tribes ever change their customs? And just like. Uh, everyone else evolves, our tribes evolve as well. And so that means that customs might change over time, um, which is what every, um, pretty much every culture or you know, group of, of people do. So, right, yeah, right. question. I mean, and that's happened over time. It's not like traditions uh, 300 years ago were frozen in time. They were changing even then. People change, music change, new instruments are introduced, new peoples come in, you hear a new story, and you adapt it, and, and it evolves, and it grows with you. Um, just like whatever culture you're a part of, I'm sure your traditions change over time as well. Uh, how did they travel in the past? And that's from Polenta Elementary. Polenta Elementary wants to know how American Indians traveled in the past. Well, historically, a long time ago, there were two, way, two main ways American Indians traveled. One was by foot, and one was by canoe, like we were talking about. So if you're traveling by foot, wow, you're going to really know your environment. You're going to be very healthy. You're going to be in shape. You're going to be very aware of everything that's going on around you. Um, however, you know, if you're traveling by foot, sometimes traveling long distances can take a long time. And you're not going to travel when the weather's really bad or if it's really snowy. Um, so that, you know, there are upsides and downsides to all different kinds of ways of traveling. Traveling by canoe, yeah, you could go a lot faster. You could carry 20 people with you. You could take a lot of goods with you. But if it was um, a rocky stream or if there was a dry spell, those canoes weren't going to be so good for you as well. So American Indians um, changed over time, and they adopted horses. They adopted cars. They adopted trains, planes. They traveled just like everybody else does now. But all peoples use the resources around them to find the best way to travel. Great. Um, are there favorite traditional foods that are still enjoyed today? And that's from Central Park School. Central Park School, traditional food still enjoyed today. Uh, so we have uh, certain foods that are important uh, to our families and that we have at holidays or family reunions. Um, but mostly, I can speak for my tribe, uh, we have southern food, country food is what we call it. So that's important to our tribe and our cultures and we have that at family reunions and things like that. Uh, do you know how many tribes there are in the country? Do you know? Go yeah, ahead. So the so question was how many tribes are in the country. Um, there is over 600 tribes in the country. There's 566 uh, what we call federally recognized tribes, and then the rest of those tribes are state recognized. So there, there's actually over 600 tribes. 600 American Indian tribes in, in the United States. Wow. Um, are there any traditional games that the children would play? Traditional games that children would play? Um, well, you know, the modern game of lacrosse actually comes from an Indian game um, that we know was played in North Carolina on up into the 1900s. So that's certainly a game. And like kids everywhere, they have, kids would have been playing with balls and marbles and maybe creating dolls, um, things like that. Running games, tag games. Children are children. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that? Oh, no. All right. So Is there any government among the tribes? Are there still chiefs? And that is from uh, Judith. 
That's a great question. Uh, so the question was, are there governments within tribes and do we still have chiefs? And the answer is yes. So each tribe does have a tribal council um, and they have somebody that they call a chief or some tribes call them chairmen, um, but they are you know, somebody in power in, in a leadership position. Um, and tribal councils usually represent each family or clan. I know with my tribe it does. We have seven council members for the seven families. Um, we have um, a secretary, um, things like that. And so we do have government that, that runs the tribe and, and makes decisions for the tribe. We have a constitution and, and everything like that. So that's a great question. And those tribes come together again with the North Carolina Indian Commission where they work to make policy for American Indians all across the state. But uh, people within tribes, are they, they're still living according to the law of North Carolina mm -hmm. and the United States as well. Is right. That, that, yep. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, so the question was, how do you become a member of a Native American tribe? Uh, it's a, a great question, and, and it varies by tribe. So each tribe has different membership criteria. I know for my tribe personally, we have criteria such as um, community involvement. You have to be descended from somebody on the tribal roles and things like that. Um, and so generally, if, if you're a descendant and you know, related to that tribe, then you, would, you could apply for membership. Each tribe, yeah, definitely has their own standards and their own ways of acknowledging who is and who is not a member of their tribe. Mm -hmm. Where are we on time, Chelsea? I want to make sure we're not keeping these people. All right, 1052. All right, great. Um, do the names of American Indians have significant meaning? Um, and that's from Ardell Charter. So the question was, do the names of American Indians have significant meaning? So is that, do you think it's names of tribes or names of... It doesn't specify. Well, I can, I can answer um, or try and speak to both. So uh, most tribal names um, do have significance. So it's either from a language, it's from a lot of places are named after bodies of water, or the bodies of water are named after the tribes. So we have like the Meharan River and the Meharan Tribe, uh, the, the Lumbee or the Lumber River. That's where the uh, Lumbee have that name from. And so they do have significance. And individuals' names, do those speak to? Sometimes I'm, yes, sometimes no. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It just it kind of really depends. Right. Yeah. All right. Just like your name may have significance in your family and speak to your culture, but it's not a rule, it's not a requirement. Right. Are you a Native American tribal leader? <laughs> Um, so I am a member of a tribe, uh, but I don't have a specific leadership role within my tribe, uh, but I, I am very active in my tribe. I uh, work on our Saponi 5K race committee, so we have a 5K run every year. I, I work on that committee. We also have a youth camp every year, and I um, work on the youth camp committee as well. So yes and no. And would you repeat what tribe you're from? Yes, uh, the, I'm a member of the Saponi tribe, which is this tribe up here. It's near the Virginia border. Yep, yeah. mm -hmm. and we're recognized in both North Carolina and Virginia. Is it common for members of tribes to live close to each other? And that's from Weatherstone Elementary again. Weatherstone Elementary wants to know if it's common for members of tribes to live close to each other. Um, yes, it is. Uh, we have very close-knit communities. Um, everyone pretty much knows each other. Uh, they might live in the same area, but at the same time, a lot of people uh, move out and move to different cities and might live in you know, another state. So we have people who are close in the same community and live close to each other, but then we have people who move out and, and go other places as well. I bet they come back home. Oh, that we always come back home, yeah. Everybody comes back home. How large is your tribe? That's from the UNC Hospital School. School. Uh, my tribe is about 900 members. We're, I think we're the second smallest tribe in this state, um, but we're a very close tribe. The largest tribe I know is the Lumbee mm -hmm. tribe, and they have over 60,000 uh, Yeah, Yeah, 55, I think it's 55,000. Around 55,000 members in the Lumbee tribe, mm -hmm. and then down to 900 or so mm -hmm. in yours, yeah. right. Uh, we have a question from Ezra who says that that raft looks really thin. How do people um, navigate that? Right, yeah. So this is pretty amazing, these canoes, um, that they were dug out of one tree, massive tree, and they would burn it down from the top. Um, so it would have been bigger. This is remnants of this 3,000-year-old uh, canoe. Um, this is just remnants of it, so it would have been a little bit bigger. Um, we've got some images up on the wall. You might see uh, some John White drawings interpreted here. So they would have been bigger. Um, they used them. They would go out at night and fish in them. Um, and they were just traveling them. I guess they had really good balance is all I can say. I happen to know that 
I believe, and I've got a collections person back there who can nod up and down, my understanding was that when they first pulled these uh, canoes out of Lake Phelps, several dozen of them were found in the bottom of Lake Phelps in 1986. My understanding is that some people um, at the time, we try to make things last forever and ever. That's part of our job here at the museum, to make sure artifacts last for hundreds of years into the future so we can enjoy and study them. But somebody told me that one of the canoes was actually uh, covered in sugar because the molecules of sugar um, went into this, this is probably paper thin right now, and helped uh, make it last for a while. Now, usually sugar's not a good preservative because bugs love sugar, and you don't want bugs near artifacts. Bad, very bad. So don't, don't try that at home. Um, but they did, they managed. Canoes were a, a major way of getting around in North Carolina. Uh, Sand Ridge Elementary School asks, how long does it take to carve a canoe? Wow. I don't know, you stop me Sand Ridge. I know Sand Ridge, you guys can stop me anytime you want. I don't know, how many people are working on it? Do they work on it around the clock? How big is the tree that they're trying to burn down? So again, they use fire to help a tree fall over. Then they build small fires on top of the tree and they're using stone tools and shells to dig out the ash, slowly but surely. So you don't want to burn it too quick because you don't want to burn up the log. You don't want to burn it too slowly because you're trying to get some ash, right? So I really don't know. I do know that here at the American Indian Festival Heritage Celebration that we do every year, we have a dugout canoe that we have been working on, museum staff and Indian visitors, American Canadian visitors and they've been working on it for several years now and we're still not finished making our canoe but we only work on it for two days of the year. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, did American Indians have schools in their tribes? Ooh, that's a good question. The question was do American Indians have schools in their tribes? Um, Traditionally, we did have tribal schools, so um, I think Sally touched on earlier back uh, in the civil rights era, we weren't segregated, so we had Indian schools, and then there's black schools, and then there was white schools. So we each did have our own tribal schools, um, but since desegregation, a lot of those have um, continued, or not existed anymore. Um, there is still a Halawasaponi tribal school, so kids still go to the tribal school there. Um, there might be others in the state as well. I'm just not yeah, the Halawas Saponi School is a charter school. Some of you may attend charter schools, so they receive a charter from the straight to set up their own school. And if you watch our video on our YouTube channel, American Indies in North Carolina, which is a separate video, you'll see some kids from the Halawas Saponi Charter School. Um, so they are working under the, the state government to create that school. All right, we've got just a few more minutes. Uh, this is from Noah. How do you know so much about America? <laughs> which, which one? <laughs> uh, well, I am an educator here at the North Carolina Museum of History, and so I love history, and I expect a lot of you love history too, even if you don't think you love history. If you love sports, you love history because sports have history. If you love dance, you love history because dance have history. Well, I love people, and people have history, and so part of the people of our state are American Indians. So um, I've been reading and, and trying to explore all the different subjects that make up the state of North Carolina. And what's really cool to me about learning about American Indians in North Carolina, yeah, their history, what they did a long time ago is awesome and amazing and it helps me understand more about our state. But getting to meet American Indians who live in North Carolina right now is even better because we're all part of the same group of people trying to make this state our home and trying to make it the best place we can. So you learn by going to museums, reading books, talking to your teachers. You guys know how to learn, you can do this. And I guess speaking for myself, I know a lot about American Indians because that's kind of my job. Um, I, I work a lot with the tribes in the state and being a member of a tribe, you're kind of always around it or most people in, who are members of a tribe are always around uh, our culture or customs. Um, so I guess that's how I kind of know so much about You didn't it. have much choice. <laughs> right, yeah, I wasn't given a choice. <laughs> Is there an average number of people in a tribe in North Carolina that's from Preston and Creekside Elementary? Uh, I don't think so because if you can prove you're a member of a tribe, then you're a member of the tribe, so okay. the tribe can grow. Mm -hmm. So that census number I gave you, 122,110 Indians, that was according to the census in 2010 when we count all the people in the state. The next time we count all the people in the state in uh, 2020, that number is going to change, right? There could be a lot of American Indians who left the state and our number will go down, or there might be a lot of American Indians who've uh, come into the state and the number will go up. Um, as far as tribal numbers, again, because you have to meet certain criteria to become a member of a tribe, um, that number can change. I know the Lumbee tribe numbers have got, you know, 
if, if you have kids who are part of the tribe and they become uh, enrolled on that actual role, the list of members of a tribe, that number is going to go up. The question was, am I a dancer? Is, is there a specific dance that I know or do? And I used to be a dancer. I used to dance a fancy shawl when I was younger. Um, but due to a sports injury, I had to stop. Um, but maybe one day I'll, I'll dance again. Um, this is also from Noah. What tools would they use, American Indians, to help them carve into stone? They'd use other stones. Okay, so the Indians that lived here hundreds and thousands of years ago, the hardest material they had was stone, and they were really good at figuring out the different properties of different kinds of stones. So we even have, I'm not going to make Jerry walk back over there, but we have a stone basket, which had to be pretty heavy to carry around, but it's made from soapstone, and soapstone is a very light stone, so that would have been easier to carve into than granite, for example or other kinds of stone. And so they knew the kind of stones they needed to chip off spearheads. Um, they just learned this knowledge by uh, trial and error and then passing it down, right? From generation to generation and learning from other people who might travel with you. Um, I'm speaking about the nomadic peoples who lived here tens of thousands of years ago or 10, 12,000 years ago. Um, do American Indians still make clothing from hides, buffalo? Um, so the question was, do American Indians still make clothes from hides? Um, not our normal everyday clothes. Uh, we buy those from the store probably just like everyone else does. Um, but as far as regalia, some regalias might still be made out of hides or leather, something like that. Um, but a lot of them are also made out of the cloth that you would get at a craft store or something like that as well. So it really depends. Some regalia might be. Right, and I think different tribes across the United States might use different mm -hmm. materials to make their regalia. But for everyday clothing, no, pretty much no. Is it common for any member of tribes to still hunt? That's not the main topic. <laughs> the question uh, was, was it? Do they still hunt? Do, oh, um, do American Indians and tribes still hunt? Um, I know that a lot of my cousins like hunt with you know rifles and cam camouflage, just like other hunters do, but not like bow and arrow hunting, but just the same way everyone else might hunt deer during deer season and things like that. Right, so if it's a hobby for them mm -hmm. or a sport, yeah. then they're gonna do it like anybody else right. might, but if that's not something they're into, no, there's yeah. no requirement. All young men must get up and go hunt. No, right, it doesn't right. work like that. They might just do, not for a full-time job either, just right. you know, recreationally. All right. Well, we've gone over a lot today. You guys have done a great job. Um, we really appreciate you joining us for our first ever live streaming event. We hope to do a lot more of these on different topics. But I hope you have an idea now that when you think about American Indians, that first thing you think about in your mind's eye, maybe you're going to think about Taryn. Or maybe you're going to think about some of these insignia. Or maybe you're going to think about people in your community going to school, going to work, doing a lot of the same things you're doing while they're still continuing some of those traditions and celebrations from the past just like you do. Remember, every single day with your choices, your words, and your actions, you make history too. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.